Right. All right. Take your Bibles this morning. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to start with verse 10. We're still on the subject of the, uh, the cup, the bread, and the blood, which is a message series on the communion service and uh, what it typifies and what it pictures. Uh, a lot of times if you can get the picture of what thing represents or what it pictures, you know, you'll, you'll appreciate it better. Uh, at least I do. And I like to find out what things, uh, like when I go through the Old Testament and I look at the tabernacle, that was a physical structure that those Israelites put up. And it had specific furniture in it and specific things all throughout. It had specific coverings. And when we did a series on it one time, and we'll do it again here so we can have it on CD, we went through every piece of that tabernacle and we showed in that tabernacle what it pictured and how it pointed you to Jesus Christ and His Word. And you'd be surprised at the things that you come up with in the tabernacle that God used to typify things that were going to happen in the New Testament. The tabernacle also is a picture of the universe. Um, I was at work the other day and uh, I was looking at some things in the Word and I got to thinking about some things that the Bible says about the universe and it's shaped um, and it's basically set up like the tabernacle. Uh, the bottom of the first thing you go to when you get to that tabernacle is that um, that brazen altar outside. That picture's hell. That picture's the lake of fire. And uh, you got to go through that laver and be washed. And you got to face the high priest, which is Jesus Christ. And you got to offer the offering that God accepts, which is the lamb without blemish. See? Which is Jesus Christ. See? And when you get on the inside of that thing, you've got a table set there with some bread. And it's got six stacks here and six stacks here. And over against the other side over there, you've got a, a candlestick with seven lights burning, and that pictures the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Ghost. And he's putting light on that table with that bread, and that bread pictures the Word of God because there's two, two rows of uh, six sitting there. And if you put six and six together, you've got 66. And when you look at your Bible, your King James Bible, it's got 66 books in it. Amen. Amen. So God told you before it came to pass how many books were going to be in that Bible. <laughs> and then you get over there to the mercy seat where the blood is uh, sprinkled on that mercy seat. That's the Holy of Holies. That's where God is. That's where we're aiming to go, as the old country man said. I'm aiming to get there. And uh, well, aim high. <laughs> because you, if you aim low, you ain't getting there. You've got to aim high because he's in heaven. And uh, the universe is set up like that, see. And then the universe is also set up as a garment. Did you know that Jesus Christ, it is said, wears the universe like a garment? And that thing's set up like a poncho. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Give you a little extra thing here real quick so you can see what I'm talking about. When you look at the... The universe is almost set up like a pyramid, like this. And it's got a hole in the top of it like this. And there's a section up there at the top of it called the frozen deep, like this. Alright? And it's got a hole in the top of it there. That's called the sea of glass. And down at the bottom of the universe, you've got a thing down here like this right here with fire that's a flame of fire that's the lake of fire at the bottom of the universe that's where the lake of fire is the lake of fire is not in the middle of the earth that's where hell is so what are you saying there preacher I'm saying there's a worse place for you to go than hell hell's not your final destination if you wind up there your final destination is at the bottom of the universe called the lake of fire which is 
a hundred thousand times worse than hell if you could imagine that. And in the middle here, you've got all the planets in the solar systems. They go like this. And they go in a circular motion like this. Scientists don't know what they're talking about. They're stupid. This is the sides of the north right here. Right here. That's the sides of the north. All right. That thing's set up like a poncho. And you know what? It's, you know what's at the top of this thing right here? The third heaven. That's where God's at. So Jesus Christ, being the head, he has his head sticking out of this poncho here in the New Testament, picturing that God is up here at the top, right here, and down here at the bottom. Revelation chapter one describes his feet as feet as if they burned in a furnace. Your feet are at the bottom. The lake of fire is at the bottom. That's where God's feet are. And the Bible says at the end of this whole thing, He's going to fold this whole thing up like a garment and lay it to the side. And on the other side of that thing, when He lays that thing aside, you're going to see His glory. And if you ain't got a glorified body, you're going to burn up. You're going to be destroyed. Now that's, that's the way that thing's set up. And, um, you know, we'll get into that sometime, hopefully, if the Lord tarries and uh, Lord willing. But it's an interesting study. And if you look at Hebrews 1, the Bible says he lays that thing aside like a garment. So when you get over there to Alaska and uh, places like that, you know what you see? You see the northern lights. You know what the northern lights are? They're shaped like a curtain floating through there. It's like a curtain. Like that tabernacle curtain. <laughs> and God is letting the scientists know they're stupid because He's got that curtain laying there as a picture of the tabernacle letting you know that the universe is what He's clothed in. The Bible says He's clothed with the clouds and the heavens. Well, the heavens, plural, would be that. And when Jesus walked the earth... You know what kind of garment he wore? He wore a seamless garment. You know what that is? That's a poncho. See? He let you know in advance what he was clothed in. It was seamless. And it had a hole at the top. When I was in the Marine Corps, when we were out there doing our training, we wore ponchos. And the thing was seamless. It was a piece of garment that laid out. And you stuck your head through the thing, and the thing draped over your whole body, and it kept you warm. It kept you from getting wet. Remember that? And those ponchos were your lifeline. That was your, that's what Jesus Christ wore. You know? Jesus never wore a robe. <laughs> I'm sorry to mess up your religion, but uh, that's not what he wore. He didn't wear a robe. He wore a poncho. <laughs> he wore a seamless garment. They put a robe on him to mock him. The Romans did when he was being beaten. But then they took it off. And there's two garments they put on him. There's some garments in there. We'll get into that later too. There's several garments that Jesus Christ had on that picture certain things. One of them was a purple robe. The other was a scarlet robe. See? Took them off, took them on. And then you look in the Gospels, you'll see in one place it'll say he had a scarlet robe on. And another place it says he had a purple robe on. And don't have time to get into all that, but that, that pictures the blood of Christ touching the thing. See? It pictures royalty, and it pictures uh, the blood atonement, it pictures um, what Christ did for you. So, anyway, first, uh, 2 Corinthians. We're on this bread. We're on this bread and what it pictures. And um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 says, Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now notice, two things are mentioned in that verse that we have in communion. Bread and fruit. 
The wine is the fruit of the vine. And the bread is the bread of sincerity and the unleavened bread, which is uh, picturing the what? The Word of God. And what is that fruit picture? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, if you abide in me, you'll bear much fruit. Amen? But if you don't abide in Jesus Christ, you will wither. You can go for a while and, and fool people and make them think you're saved, make them think you're a Christian, make them think you're religious. But after a while, the, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will get a hold of you, and you'll be exposed for what you really are, and that's nothing more than a devil in sheep's garments. See? Pretending to be something that you're not. Alright, that ministering there, the seed being the Word of God. Now let's look at that, Mark chapter 4. That Word of God is said to be bread for the food. And if you don't spend time in the Bible every day, you're starving yourself. Amen. I'm just saying like that. Some people don't pick their Bible up except on Sunday mornings. I'm telling you, you need to pick your Bible up every day. You know, people get nervous when I say that. He's fanatical. Yeah, I am. That's me. Um, and my family will tell you, I mean, you can ask them anytime after church if you want to. Pull them aside when I'm not around and ask them, how much time does he spend in the Word? They'll tell you. I'm in that book every day. I'm not telling you to do something I'm not doing. See, now there's days I do more than others, but I spend some time in this book every day, and I, I wouldn't tell you to do it if I ain't doing it, see, and you need to spend that time in the book because, let me ask you something, how many of you feed your face every day? I know I'm being crude, ain't I? <laughs> Excuse me, how many of you have um, the daily vitamins and minerals and fruits and vegetables and meat? that is required by the FDA <laughs> every day. Translated into sound, how many of you feed your face every day? <laughs> Amen. I mean, uh, do you feed it or not? I do. I mean, you can look at me and tell I, I don't go without eating. Well, you should be that fat in the Word. Amen. <laughs> I mean, if some of you, uh, if some of you ate as much spiritually as you did physically... You'd be an anemic. <laughs> Amen. You'd be, you'd be starved. You'd, you'd be, they'd be looking at you like, my God, look at her. She looks like one of them Kate, uh, Olsen twins uh, that's out there looking anorexic, you know. But then again, how, if, you, if you ate spiritually like you do physically, man, what would you look like? See? We need to spend time in the book. Look at Mark chapter 4, and we're going to go down here uh, to verse 14. The Bible says the sower. Remember, Paul said over there that he's ministering seed. And that's seed that is sown. In verse 14 he says the sower soweth what? The word. So the, sow, the seed that is sown is the word of God. That's why the devil is trying to get that seed out of your hand. And put something else there. If you got the wrong kind of seed, you're going to get the wrong kind of fruit. You're going to get the wrong kind of harvest. The reason we got the mess we've got going on in churches in half for the last hundred years is because we've switched Bibles. We've took the Bible out and gave a counterfeit to the congregation, and now we're feeding them a bunch of junk food, and now they're coming around looking like a bunch of junk addicts. Amen. The Bible says here in the next part, he says, And these are they by the wayside. Where the word is sown. But look at what happens. But when they have heard, Satan, Satan, cometh immediately. How many of you can testify to that? You you could be you could be sitting there watching that TV and watching all you could you could just feed your face spiritually all day long watching that them movies on TV all day long, ain't nobody will bother you. You just say, well, you know what? I need to put that off and 
and I need to get in my Bible and read a little while. And as soon as you crack that book open and start reading, the phone rings. <laughs> the door knocks. And then all of a sudden you get all these thoughts. I need to get this done. I need to go here. I need to get this done over here. I need to clean this over here. I need to fold this over here. I need to wash this over here. I mean, all this stuff starts. You weren't thinking about that ten minutes ago when you were watching the movies. What is it about that book that when you pick it up, all of a sudden, all these things come to mind that i got to do. I don't have time. You finally come to the conclusion and say, I don't have time to read the Bible. So you don't waste time with it. That's the devil. See, the devil's coming in there to immediately take that word out that's sown in your heart. And they can get you distracted. He will. I mean, I like good preaching. But it don't replace the Bible. Now, did you hear what I said? I like good reading. I like I like to read books and stuff. It don't replace the Bible. Amen. Amen. Don't be fooled. He's got different tactics and methods that he can get you out of this and into something else. I mean things that are spiritual, things that are religious, things that are noble, things that are good, there's nothing wrong with. But as long as he can keep you busy doing something else besides that book, he's accomplished what he's trying to do. The Bible says here, when they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. That's a lot of people. They come to this church to start with and they say, man, I like that church. <laughs> Stick around a while. <laughs> you might like it still, but uh, it, it gets rough sometimes. The Bible says they like it, they, they receive it uh, with gladness and have no, uh-oh, verse 17 is very key. They have no root in themselves. What does that mean? It means they ain't saved. There's people out there that get excited about the Bible, but they're not saved. And so when the meat of the Word gets in them, they turn away from it. Have no root in yourselves. Do you know who the root is? Jesus Christ said, I am the root and the offspring of David. That's Revelation 6, uh, 22, 16. He's the root. And they have no root in themselves. And so endure before time. And afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are what? Offended. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people out there to get offended when the real preaching of the word goes forth. That mean old nasty preacher getting out there on the street corner, you know, and pointing his finger at them saying they're going to hell. You're offending a lot of people. I had a lady tell me that one day when I was out there street preaching. She said, you, 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 you're doing more harm than good. You're, you're offending so many people. Good, that's what I'm aiming to do. That's right. Amen. What do you mean you're trying to offend them? Because the Bible says offenses come for the word's sake. And if they're offended, it's because I'm preaching the right stuff. If I was preaching what the world wants me to preach, nobody would get upset, including the church. <laughs> But when you get out there and get into deep things of God and preach the things like we do in this church, brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. There's going to be some people out there that hate your guts and can't stand you and get offended just looking at you. And they can't even tell you why they don't like you. But I know why they don't. The spirit that's in you is different than the spirit that's in them. The Bible says here that they... Uh, they have no root in themselves, so endure for a time after when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake. Immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. It started out fruitful, but it winds up unfruitful. Because the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things get in there and occupy their mind and get them distracted. And I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes 
Now, I tell you, you get to read your Bible every day, and you heard me say that earlier, but let me tell you something. Let me just be real frank and honest with you. Sometimes it is a battle and a struggle to get in that book and stay focused. I was in it the other day, and I could literally feel the attack of the enemy on my soul. I mean, it was heavy. It was so heavy that I had to struggle just to stay awake to read it, and it was midday. They'll try to put a slumbering spirit on you. Make you go to sleep. <laughs> Amen. And I know it won't God. God will never try to pull you away from that book. And it's, it's, it's a different type of thing when, you, when you're reading the Bible and the Spirit of God comes in the room and gives you a peace and you go to sleep like that. This was different. This was an oppressive spirit. And buddy, I kept with it and I stuck with it and God showed me some things. God showed me some things. See. The devil knows when you're getting close to something. <laughs> and yeah. buddy, he he gets nervous when you get close to some kind of revelation the Lord's trying to give you, and he's like, mm -mm, we gotta get we gotta stop that. If the people get a hold of that, it'll be a whole new light coming in their eye. Now look at what this says. The Bible says, These are they which are sown on good ground. This is where you want to be at. Such as hear the word, they heard it, and receive it, and bring it forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And you see that thirtyfold, sixtyfold, and some a hundred? He's likening that to a palm tree that grows in Palestine. Palm trees grow to three different lengths. They grow to thirtyfold, which is a. Um, I think about a 30-foot tree, then a 60-foot tree, and then a 100-foot tree. And you know what the Bible likens you to over there in the Psalms? He likens people to trees. See? And trees bear fruit, right? Every tree in the world has some kind of fruit on it. You may not eat it, but it's there. <laughs> And the Bible says here in these verses that we just read that you know what's, you know what's uh, interesting about these people? Every single one of them, Sister Carolyn, heard the word. There's not one person in any of these categories that did not hear the word. They all heard it. But they responded different to it. And that's the key. And Paul says, I'm the minister and I'm sowing the seed, the bread to feed you. And that bread is the word of God. It's up to you how you respond to it. Alright, now. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. It's bread for food. First Peter chapter 1 verse 23. Here's that seed again. The Bible says, being born again, not of what? Corruptible seed. But of incorruptible. What's the incorruptible seed? By the word of God. And look at what it says about the word of God. It liveth and abideth forever. That book you hold in your hands alive. You know why? Because God's in it. From cover to cover. Every page of that Bible, God's right there. Makes no difference whether you see Him or not. He's still there. And He is there, ready to talk to you. That's how God talks to you. He speaks on the pages of that Bible. His handprint is all over it. And brothers and sisters, when you get in that Bible and you get close to God, the devil gets close to you. Amen. He's right there ready to pull you away from it. Because he knows what's in that book. He knows it. He can quote it to you. He quoted it to Jesus. He didn't quote it right, but he quoted it. He messed it up. That's what he does. He corrupts it. 
But he knows it. He couldn't corrupt it if he didn't know it. See? Alright, but it's incorruptible seed and it lives and it abides forever. That's what that bread pictures, folks. That's what that bread that we take during communion pictures and every time you take that communion bread, you're saying, I receive the Word of God and I want to bear fruit for the Lord. And I want that fruit to rise up on the inside of me and make me a fruitful Christian in the vineyard of the Lord. Did you notice that in the Gospels, Jesus likened it to a vineyard? A vineyard. What do you get out of a vineyard? Grapes. Grapes. What else you get out of a vineyard? Wine. The fruit of the vine. Take the clusters of those grapes and you take them and you squeeze them into that cup and then you drink it. That's what Jesus did at the Last Supper. He took those grapes and He squeezed them into that cup. That was customary of the Jews at the Passover. They would take a big old fat cluster of those things and they would squeeze them things together until all that juice went into that cup and then they took that hallowed juice and they drank it. And Jesus said, when you drink this, this is my blood. How about that? He says, when you eat this bread, this is my body. Broken for you. Now, going back to Matthew. Chapter 26, I believe it is. Verse 26. The next thing that Jesus Christ says is that He gave it. Let's look at it. Matthew 26. There's things there that you just got to break it down to see what he's saying. I love to dig into the thing, man. I, I have a bad... Well, it's not a bad habit. I have a habit. <laughs> when, I read, when I read a passage, I break the thing down, man. I dissect it. I want every little piece of that to... Run somewhere. And if you'll do that with your... I'm going to tell you something. You can take one verse. I have done this. I've took one verse and it run me through the whole Bible. And I mean by the time I got done with that one verse, breaking it down, word for word for word for word and running the references, I wound up in probably two or three hundred scriptures. <laughs> that was in Genesis. We did a study in Genesis one time where we, only, we could only get through the first three chapters, brother. And that took us three years. I finally said, we, we'll, we'll just move on to something else. <laughs> All right. Look at verse 26 here. He says here, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it, and, and break it rather, and gave it. That's very important that you notice that. He gave it. He didn't hold it back. When He blessed the thing, He broke it. And then he gave it. What is that picture? The Holy Scriptures are to be taught. They are to be preached. They are to be given to the masses. Over a thousand years of the church's history, the Roman Catholic Church refused to give people the Word of God. They kept it chained up in monasteries, chained up in their cathedrals, and would not allow the common people to read it in the common language. And if you were found reading the Word of God in the common language, you will put it to stake and burn, tortured, killed, murdered, drowned, whatever method they decided to use at the moment. If you don't believe that, go read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, go read the Martyrs of the Catacombs, and go read uh, Martyr's Mirror, a book about that thick, and about that wide, I got a copy of it, and you'll hear story after story after story in there where those priests and those bishops refuse to allow the people the Word of God. Now Jesus, when He broke that bread, He gave it. See? Look at Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verse 11. It's 
just focus on that word he gave it for a few moments. Verse 11 says this. It says, the Lord did what? He gave the word. The Lord gave it. Great was the company. Psalm 68, verse 11. No, sir. 68, verse 11. That's okay. Give you a chance to get there and read it. The Bible says the Lord gave it. And then it's connected to that giving is something that we ought to shout about, and that is the next part of that verse. Great was the company of those that what? Published it. Tyndall, Williams, um, several men through there. King James Bible translators. Uh, Wycliffe. These men read these scriptures and understood that if the people were going to be set free from their sins and set free from bondage to Rome, they had to be given the word of God which sets you free. That makes you free. That makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. The Lord gave the word, see. But great is the company that a that publish it. And thank God we still got some publishers today that'll print and publish the Word of God. They're getting fewer and fewer, but we got a few out there still. Take your Bible and look over here at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Where are we at, Carrie, on time? I don't either. Who? 1125? 45, okay. Alright. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. You ought to be familiar with this one. All Scripture is what? Given. Notice that. Given, not held back. God wants you to know His words. He wants you to have them. He wants to give them to you. The enemy, listen to me, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The enemy comes in to take that word and take it away from you, prevent you from hearing it, prevent you from receiving it, prevent it from having any fruitful effect in your life. See? He don't care really that you read it, honest, if you want to understand the truth. Because in that scripture we read, they all read it. They all heard it. What are you going to do with it? That's the question. See, when you start putting it into action, that's when the devil starts saying, Ah, oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> we can't have that. We're going to raise up some religious people to oppose you. See, because that's not what the Baptists have done all these years. That's not what the Methodists are used to having happen in their services. That's not what the Catholic Church has traditionally taught. Well, the blazes with all of that. If God tells you to do something, and the world, and the church world, and the religious world says to do something different, I'm going to go with what God says. It don't matter if we've never done it before. Bless your heart, it's time we start doing it. Praise God. The world looks at us as oddities because we take the Bible seriously and we want to practice it. See, as long as you're going with the flow, they don't care. You, you can go to church. You, you can even have a Bible. But once you start putting that thing into practice and you start looking different, and being peculiar, the Bible says. See, we are a pecu peculiar people. You're an oddball to the world. The Bible says that when you're like that, that's when the enemy comes in and says, wait a minute, we got a problem here. We can't have that. We, we can't have you guys being so winners like that. We can't have you passing out tracts and talking to people about Jesus Christ. We can't have people when they come to the altar and get saved, get baptized immediately. 
Because our, our church t- teaches we only do baptisms once a year. <laughs> we can't have y'all doing communion every service because after all, that's just too much. Too, too much. Don't do that. Do it every quarter. <laughs> Never mind the Word of God says they did it every time they came together. See? Never mind that when the women come up to receive communion, they have to have their heads covered according to the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 11. That's just weird. That's because you haven't been reading your Bible. (laughs) It's weird because the church world has dropped the ball and has stopped practicing the book and just been religious all these years. We're good Baptists. We're good Methodists. We're good Presbyterians. Yeah, but you're stinking when it comes to the Word of God and practicing God's Word. And when we get together, we must do what God said or we should just close the doors and go home. And the church said, Amen. I'll say Amen for you. It's quiet here today. But I'm telling you that God expects us to walk in the Word of God. All Scripture, listen to it, is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration shows up one other time in the Bible. And you know what it's referenced to? To God breathing into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and him becoming a living soul. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means God took that book, He formed it, He shaped it, He put it together, and when He got that thing exactly the way He wanted He said... And it became alive. And it's been alive ever since. The Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? That's what I've been teaching out of the last, since 2012, doctrine. Good doctrine. Stuff that you ain't going to hear nowhere else. <laughs> doctrine. What else? For reproof. Sometimes I got to get on you. Amen. Take you out to the woodshed. Whip you a little bit. Get you back in get in line and get you back in where you need to be. Get the sheep back in the corral. You know, they're getting out there too far in the wilderness. The Bible says for reproof, for correction. I got to straighten out some things that you falsely believe. See, a lot of you, when you came here, you had certain ideas about certain things. Some of you come from backgrounds that said, you can lose your salvation. Some of you came from backgrounds that said, tongues is for today. See? And I had to correct it gently with the Word of God. And show you in the Word of God where these things were not what you've been taught. Where did I go to? I pointed you to the Scriptures. I showed you in the Word of God where these things are what God said about this subject. And God's got an answer for everything. The Bible says, for instruction in righteousness. Sometimes we've got to be instructed. That the man of God, that's everybody in this building, spiritually, The man of God may be perfect. I may want to be perfect. I do. Thoroughly furnished unto what? All good works. Not just some. The goal, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing it. All good works. Because some Christians are just content with doing a couple of things. And then riding... The truck on the way home, you know. God wants you to get to a point where it's all good works. See, thoroughly furnished. I'm not just content with getting to heaven. Are you? I want to lay something down at Jesus' feet. I want Him to look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want him to look at me and say, it's a good job you did there. 
while I'm laying on my face bawling. <laughs> Just thankful to be there, right? But I want to give him something. He gave me so much. I can do the little bit I can do for him here in my life that I got left. I spent years wasting it on stupid stuff. Now that I'm in and now that I'm committed to doing what I'm doing now, I want it. I want to make up for the lost time, not only make up for the lost time, but the last little bit of life I've got on this earth, I want to give it all I've got for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at another one here. Matthew 10. Where are we at here? Okay, I see a time. Alright, Matthew. This is where we'll close at, right here. Matthew 10, 8. Matthew 10, 8. In Matthew 10, 8, the Bible says here, when He's talking to the disciples and He gives them a commission concerning the kingdom of heaven, I'm, getting, I'm making a spiritual application here in verse 8, so just bear with me. He says, heal the sick. You know how you can heal the sick today spiritually? Give them the Word of God. You'll heal their souls. See, God's still in the business of healing people. If you don't believe that, why do you pray for people? <laughs> I know some people that don't believe God heals anymore. That's not this preacher. I know God heals. I've seen Him heal. Miraculously, progressively sometimes, miraculously sometimes, instantaneously sometimes, um, baffle the doctor sometimes. I mean, I've seen Him do it all. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a healing that comes with believing what God said in His Word. And when we preach the Word to people and we get them out of spiritual bondage and we get them out of the junk that they're uh, caught up in in the world and get them in church and get them rooted and grounded in the Word of God and, get, and the things of God, we have brought healing to them through the Word of God. The Bible says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. You know what the lepers are? The lepers are those people walking around with sin on their soul and they don't know how to get rid of it. And it's killing them. And that's the majority of the world. And in fact, that's everybody in the world. It's okay. I hear it. It's the majority of the world. And listen to me. That sin can only be broken. That leprosy can only be broken through the Word of God. Cleanse the lepers. The Bible says that He cleanses the church with the Word of God. Cleanses and washes it. Remember that one? Over there in Ephesians. Look at the next thing. Cast out devil. Well, I missed one. Raise the dead. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We literally, spiritually, raise the dead when we preach the Word of God to them. And they get saved. You know why? They come up a new creature in Christ Jesus. They go down as a dead, lost sinner. And they come up through the blood of Christ as a born again, new creature in Christ Jesus. We're raising the dead. The Bible says, cast out devils. Brother, if you don't think that's so. You get in a service where there's a bunch of people with a bunch of demonic spirits on them and you start preaching the Word of God and just watch them get mad and get up and walk out. I ain't got to listen to that. <laughs> Man, we've had them slam the doors, get up, stomp out, make a fuss, point at me at the pulpit while I'm preaching. You know, you're, uh, uh, they've called me all kinds of things. <laughs> it's okay. I know what you are. I know what's going on with you. I know what's controlling you. See, when the Word of God goes forth, it casts them devils out. They can't handle it. They'll stay for a while, but when that thing gets hot, they got to get out of the kitchen. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And the devils will flee when the Word of God's preached. The Bible says, cast out devils, and look at the next part here. Freely you have received, freely give. That's why as a rule in this church, when we get letters from inmates in the prisons, 
We give them a Ruckman Reference Bible free of charge. We don't charge them anything for it. See? And it's a good Bible. It's a nice Bible. And it's big words. Freely, I've received. Listen, God's given me so much. I'm talking about the things that He's shown me in His Word. I'm talking about the fact that He saved me. I'm talking about the fact that He put me in the ministry. I'm talking about the fact that He restored me from a life of sin when I was out there being a prodigal son. I'm talking about the fact that I got out of the ministry and got back in the ministry by the grace of God because of His grace and mercy. God's given me so much. He's restored me. He's put me back in the pulpit. He's put me back in a place where I can preach to people and give them the Word of God when I didn't think that was possible. He opened up doors. He opened up uh, abilities. He gave me everything. He introduced me to the uh, rightly divided doctrines of this book right here and the revelation of the King James Bible. He's given me knowledge. He's given me understanding about spiritual circumcision. How could I possibly charge anybody to give them the Word of God? God's given me so much. He's given me a beautiful wife, beautiful family. How could I possibly say, all right now, you, you gotta give me some money, or I ain't giving you nothing. When they write me a letter, and they ain't got money anyway. But you know. And then I get around here to some of these churches, listen to me. I'm gonna close right here. I come to some of these churches and try to get them to help us with sending Bibles into the prisons and I either get no response or I get a response, well, it costs too much money or I get a response, well, well, we don't have time. We got, you know, they got the Gideons. Guess what? The Gideons ain't giving them the Bible anymore like it's supposed to be. They're giving them that junk called the New International Stuff. They're giving them the ESV. They're giving them corrupt Bibles now. So you can't rely on that. When a man's begging you for the word of God in a prison cell, you know what Jesus said in Matthew 25, don't you? I was in prison and you came and visited me. What's the best way to visit somebody than give them the word of God? Amen. Especially when they took the time to write a letter and ask you for it. You better believe we're going to keep knowing that here. That's what the majority, other than paying for the lights and the uh, building payment, that's what the majority of the um, money that comes in this church goes to. It goes to buy Bibles for those inmates. I don't get a salary, just so you know. <laughs> I get my phone bill paid. My, my cell phone is $45, right, Carrie? Plus tax, or so maybe $48. That's, that's the only thing the church pays for me in that regard. See, and I keep a phone because I'm trying to get up with y'all, <laughs> or y'all can get up with me, okay? But I'm just saying that, not not boasting, but I'm just letting you know. Priorities in this church are the gospel, the ministry of Jesus Christ, and getting the word out to people, and that's the bread. That's what this represents. That's what we're offering you every Sunday morning when we do communion. Are you on board with us? Do you see this like we see it? Do you receive it like we received it from the Lord? See, that's what we're doing. All right, we're going to close right there. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Did you get a blessing? All right, good. If you didn't, pray about it. <laughs> Go back and listen to the CD a couple more times. All right, um, Brother Jack, close us in prayer this morning, brother. Thank you, Lord, for the time to get to spend your word together. We ask God to bless each one of us. Pray to your God for one that's lost. Yes. That is not saved. That uh, they will take your word to heart. They will ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive them of the sin. Yes, Lord. Amen. Amen, Lord.
we'll take a break there and we'll come back again around 12.20, I guess, to receive communion. For those that want to receive it before, if you have to leave and go somewhere, I'll give it to you uh, up here at the front. So just come to the front if you want to receive communion. And can't stay for the service part of it. Ooh, that mango's mango. All right, Brother Chuck, God bless you. All right, Brother John, God bless you. All right, God bless you. All right, Wilbur and Wilma, God bless you. God bless you too, Pastor. Um, Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, I don't know whose phone is whose. Let's do that one's mine. That's Carrie's. Whose phone is this? Okay. God bless you both. You want that? Um, 